the po okay political defeat and practices of persistence is the second theme collective and personal debt and care is our third theme and camps borders and the ethics and politics of hospitality is our fourth theme our hope is that by exploring and connecting forms of knowledge that are rooted in historical changing realities of devastation, destruction, geopolitical inequality and exploitation, these conversations will connect creative, critical and open-ended vocabularies in order to articulate through a grounded or situated approach pathways through the impasses of our times. The International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs is generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. And we thank them for their commitment and support of the consortium and its projects. I also want to thank, very importantly, the members of the consortium team, as well as the members of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research for all the work they've done to set up and help run today's event. In particular, I want to thank Brianna George, Miranda Schoenburn, Patricia Dunlap, and Tim Wyman McCarthy for all their work. In today's conversation about environmental and colonial destructions, as well as the relationships between them, our three speakers in their roles as artists, scholars, and activists will address the planetary crisis of our times in its relationship to past and present practices of plunder, waste making, and preservation. I will introduce all three guest speakers at once so we can then plunge into the conversation. I will be asking a series of questions that will help lead the conversation. Um, but please send questions at any moment using the Q&A tab at the bottom, if you're on a computer at least, at the bottom of your screen, of your Zoom screen because we'll leave plenty of time for conversation and debate with all of you uh, at the end. So I will introduce uh, our speakers, our guests in the, orders in, in the order in which they will speak uh, answering the questions I posed that they've been thinking about. Jumana Mana is a visual artist working primarily with film and sculpture. Her work explores how power is articulated through relationships, open, often focusing on the body and materiality in relation to narratives of nationalism and histories of place. She was awarded the A.M. Katan Foundation's Young Palestinian Artist Award in 2012 and the Ars Viva Prize for Visual Arts in 2017. Mana has participated in numerous film festivals and exhibitions around the world, among them the Nordic Pavilion at the 57th Venice Biennale, the 54th and 56th Biennale International Film Festivals, and the 66th and 68th Berlinale. Jumana Mana was raised in Jerusalem, and she's currently based in Berlin, where she's joining us today from. Sofia Stamatopoulou-Robbins is assistant professor of anthropology at Bard. Her research centers around infrastructure, discard studies, science and environment, climate change, colonialism and postcoloniality, austerity, the sharing economy, property, housing, the Middle East and Europe. Her first book, Waste Siege, The Life of Infrastructure in Palestine, which was published last year, explores what happens when, as Palestinians are increasingly forced into proximity with their own wastes and with those of their occupiers, waste is transformed from matter out of place, per prevailing anthropological wisdom, into matter with no place to go or its own ecology. And Malcolm Ferdinand, was born and raised in Martinique and is a researcher in political science at the National Scientific Research Center in Paris, or in France actually, sorry, but he's based at the University Paris Dauphine. His research draws on the fields of political philosophy, political ecology, and post-colonial theory with a particular focus on the Caribbean region. His recently published book, Une Ecologie Decoloniale, provides a different conceptualization of ecological issues, one that encompasses the history and legacies of slavery and colonization in the Americas, adopting the perspectives of the enslaved. An English language translation of the book, I am very happy to say is forthcoming next year in the Consortium's Critical South book series, which is published with Polity Books. 
So welcome all, welcome Jumana, Sophia, and Malcolm. Welcome everyone out there in, uh, in the Zoom webinar from all parts of the world. Um, thank you all for being here at these different times and these very difficult times. Um, and I think we will start uh, with a, a question I will pose to all three of you and we'll hear first from Jumana and then from Sophia and then from Malcolm um, and we'll move on from there. So how could you, or not how, sorry, but could you describe your engagement with environmentalism and colonial destruction in relation to one or more of the following, plunder, waste, and preservation? Jumana, do you yeah, want to start? Yeah, thank you, Natalia, for the introduction and the question. Um, I'm gonna do a mixture of screen share with some images and also just speak directly. So um, bear with me, I hope I'll go smooth. Um, over the past five or six years, I've been interested in the politics of preservation and particularly the paradoxes that accompany the modernist urge to categorize and preserve. And this has led me through various sites and disciplines, including archaeological digs, music archives, herbariums, and agricultural research institutes. And what I've been interested in is how the urge to preserve often entails an artificial freezing of time. So these archives of various kinds often do keep a record of the cultural forms that are perhaps no longer present, but their act of preservation is usually part of the historical processes that led to the erasure of those very forms in the first place. So for instance, if we take seed banks, um, and seed banks are basically large refrigerators which store, store thousands of samples of crop seeds in minus 18 degrees Celsius, these banks are often the place where to find seeds that are either quite rare or no longer exist in farmers' fields, but also quite regular seeds that we, that we cultivate and eat. Um, and in that sense, these seed banks are crucial resources for biodiversity. But the proliferation of these seed banks happened within and through agricultural institutions that are partially responsible for the immense loss of biodiversity that we see today. So they are in fact the same institutions behind the Green Revolution, which as many know, is the industrialization of agriculture. And these institutions first collected seeds from small farmers for the sake of breeding and research, and then encouraged these very same farmers to replace their local seeds with standardized high yielding seeds or modern seeds, <laughs> which were boosted by chemical inputs. Um, so the result of that is that over time, the biodiversity that was first collected from small farmers or from the wild came to be frozen and centralized in the seed banks and no longer found in the fields. So maybe a more familiar and older example is the history of museums. <laughs> um, buildings that care for and display objects that they have in their collection, be them ethnographic or archaeological. And it's off, they often have arrived there with a provenance that's entangled in a history of colonial plunder, or at minimum a displacement and an alienation of those objects from their original functions. So now I'm going to go into the screen share mode to show you some images. Yeah. All right, do you have a full screen there? Okay. So my, my interest in preservation and archives began in Jerusalem uh, when I was looking into the early modernity of the city and the kind of research that was being produced specifically by biblical scholars who were traveling to Palestine for religious and scientific purposes. The gaze of these primarily American and European scholars sought to restore their fantasy of an ancient Middle East. And they created an artificial freezing of time that relegated Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria that were kind of conceived of as the Bible lands into a fixed and imagined past that has not entered and according to some should not enter modern times. And alongside landscape photographs, portraiture, memorabilia, diaries, and so on, <clears throat> I very often came across plants either in the form of postcards, such as these, which were very popular at the time, sending postcards from the Holy Land from specific places in Palestine um, with pressed flowers from, from those sites. Uh, also photographs uh, of plants, but also herbarium sheets. Um, so these, cap these, these images of plants um, captured my interest because they're so beautiful. 
and I was drawn to the violence behind these beautiful things. They're both records of the early admiration towards the botanical diversity of the region. But once again, they are the early steps of its categorization and the collection of plants for capital accumulation. So this research is what led me to George Edward Post, who's the man you see uh, in the image. He was one of the first botanists to collect and categorize the flora of the Middle East. And Post arrived in Lebanon, at the time it was called Greater Syria, in 1863 from America, starting a new life as a missionary and doctor, spreading the word of God and modern science to the Levant. He co-founded what is now uh, known as the American University of Beirut, and between working as a surgeon, dentist, and teacher, pursuing archaeology, translating books to Arabic, Post liked to go outdoors, where he collected plants and stuck them on paper sheets. <clears throat> Studying botany in greater Syria was unlike exploring any other place, according to Post, not only for the thrilling and important events of human history of which it has been theater, but for its great diversity and its remarkable fauna and flora. So Post was responsible for creating the first extensive herbarium of the region. And as a biblical scholar, he was motivated for finding clues of scripture better understand the Bible. So he would actually travel to places that were mentioned in the Bible and see if the flora mentioned in those stories were in fact to be found in modern day Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, uh, because he believed that this would help unlock Christian theology. So when the Levantine landscape was elegantly but forcefully made to fit a two dimensional format, it was also folded to fit big business, a practice that had become, begun two centuries earlier to quench Europe's national and trade ambitions. It's the studies of botany that brought order to the disorder of plants and created systems that assisted the large transfer of flora and fauna from the four corners of the world to European centers. And it's through this Western biblical imaginary um, that local societies were ignored in their complexity, forms of knowledge and practice that was right there in front of them. It's this scientific mapping and selective historical research that laid the foundation for the colonial rule to come. Um, I'm just gonna stop the share again, a second. Um, so I just wanna tie this back to the first example I was giving of seed banks. Um, so it was through my research on seed banks and I'm gonna kind of hopefully in the next question I can talk through the actual art projects um, that are behind this research. Um, it's through my research on seed banks that I became, came to understand that this colonial and orientalist mechanism of freezing and relegating things to the past, first imposed on non-European societies, came to extend to biological life at large under industrial capitalism. Um, so this is a kind of very brief and rapid run through of some of the things I've been thinking about and I hope they'll become clearer as I kind of show some images of my work. Thank you, Jumana. That was a, a, an amazing uh, way to s begin. Um, Sophia, do you want to tackle the, um, that first question also on your engagement yes. with environmentalism and colonial destruction? Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen. Let me just make sure it's working. Are we good? Oops, I don't want that there. All right. Okay, so I want to acknowledge first um, that here in the Bard College area in the Hudson Valley, we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lenape and the Stockbridge Mohican. Um, thanks also to Samir Esmer and Natalia Brizuela for bringing us together. So today I'd like to think about some of the less intuitive aspects of my work as it relates to colonial destruction and environmentalism. And I say that because I think it's important to think counterintuitively while we also think about um, what it would take to make a better, a more just world. Okay. My first project was an ethnography of waste management in Palestine. My method took its cue from science and technology studies and discard studies by starting with waste. I began by asking what constituted waste materially and semiotically for whom it was a problem and where it went or couldn't go. In other words, I did not begin by assuming how waste related to power. 
My aim instead was to understand power through waste. So I'll answer this first question by speaking about what I learned by starting with waste in this way. So I think that we tend to take for granted what we mean when we say colonial destruction. A few things stand in for what I think is a broader and more complex category. In relation to the environment, phenomena we associate with colonial destruction include pollution, extinction, ex extraction, destruction of, re of infrastructures, colonial warfare that destroys land, uh, interruption of access for the colonized to land and water and therefore to life ways. Um, these phenomena have in common that they seem to have obvious perpetrators. Examples include the Dakota Access and Keystone pipelines. Activists could track which government officials approved the pipelines, funders, and beneficiaries. This also made future victims of the pipelines identifiable and mobilization for justice easier. These phenomena are also usually framed in terms of their subtractive powers. They're part of a legitimately declensionist framing of colonialism where lifeways and environments are dismantled. Anti-Keystone XL activists, for example, um, argued that the project would risk oil spillage in the fragile ecosystem of the land hills and would increase dependence on fossil fuels contributing to global warming. Since the late 1990s, the Palestinian Authority has promoted single use and other cheap plastics production and import in an effort to simulate normalcy um, in the occupied economy. Cash strapped Palestinians have little choice but to purchase and discard plastics at high and even alarming rates. But their discards have no good place to go. Among other things, Israel controls 60 to 70% of the land in the West Bank and essentially prohibits Palestinian construction there. Obstruction from, uh, obstructed from exporting trash or building recycling facilities by the Israeli authorities, the PA has built underground storage sites called landfills for trash. Landfills integrate toxic materials into the environment, altering possibilities for land use, especially agriculture, decreasing land values and rendering Palestinians less civilized in the eyes of environmentally minded Israeli society, um, which um, tends to favor getting rid of landfills for Israel. The PA thereby undermines its own goal of being recognized as environmentally friendly enough to be sovereign and damages future prospects for human land relations in Palestine. So my research on these issues provoked me to consider three questions about colonial destruction. One, how do we understand colonial destruction when its perpetrators are not obvious or are diffuse in such a way that they include less visible actors like colonized engineers and ideologies like consumer-led or materialist liberation? Two, what effects does accountability diffusion have on whether environmental justice is a salient discourse mobilized to combat destruction and by whom? And here I'm thinking of the fact that my Palestinian interlocutors who were inundated by plastics, first of all, focused more on things like littering and self critiques or critiques of the PA than on the injustice of being inundated with plastics as an effect of colonial rule. And uh, they also, many also saved environmental justice critiques for the most obvious or overt instances of toxic dumping by Israeli authorities and settlements on Palestinian land. So to put it schematically, I wonder how we can think of waste produced within colonialism, including by the bodies and practices of the colonized, as what Anne Stoller calls imperial debris, on a continuum with colonial dumping and demolition. And if we do that, I'm wondering how we might need to adjust our understanding of environmental justice. So my final question that I come to from this example um, is that if Palestinian Authority import and production of plastics is part of colonial destruction, how is colonial destruction productive, both materially and in terms of the reconfiguration of society, um, uh, human non-human relations and politics, for example, when plastics become a part of the occupied Palestinian landscape? And I'll stop there. 
Let me find my little mouse. That's the key. There we go. Thanks so much, Sophia. Um, Malcolm, it would be great to hear from you now. Um, on that so first I'll, question. Well, <laughs> well, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, of this panel. I, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, my engagement with um, colonial destruction and environmentalism starts from an embodied experience, the experience of uh, being born and raised in a Caribbean island, uh, an island that was colonized um, by the French Empire and where there was um, a, the, the transatlantic slavery. And um, maybe one thing I, I didn't mention is the fact that I have a, a kind of double education. On, on one side, I'm an environmental engineer and on, on the other side, I'm a political scientist. And so I got to be, to see uh, different sides of, of a similar world problem. Um, but, but the first shock that I got uh, is the realization of a fracture. When I wanted to get in, involved or even study environmentalism as a movement, as a line of thought, as a, a critical thinking with, with various different groups and thinkers, I realized, and like many others, that they were lacking um, a major part relating to the colonial history to, and of course the colonial resistance and to slavery. So my first question was what happened to, uh, to the colonial history in the construction of environmental thought, in the construction of environmental movement? And there I realized that there, there has been an exclusion at times willingly, forcefully, like the creation of his first uh, uh, park or reserve in, in, in Yosemite in the west of, of, uh, of the, the States, United States, but also in both parts of Africa. At times there has been a, an, an easiness with which we assume that the space where we think of ecological issues is a white space, is a space where the mind, there are minorities, but more, more of the time it's a space that is less diverse than the rest of the spaces in societies, especially in, in, in France or in other northern countries. The second question for me was, what does it mean then to think of ecological issues, both on the local and global scale, from the perspectives of those who were not meant to survive? the empire in slavery, as Audrey Lorde would say. Those who were on the margin of the empires, or those who were, who were on, in, in the wake of a ship, like Christina Sharp would say. And from a personal experience, living and growing up in Martinique was growing up around uh, plantations of sugar canes, plantation of, banana, of, of bananas. What does it mean then to think of ecology in a space that has struct structurally uh, avoided people looking at me from being owners of the land, from having a relation of, to the land, from making the land their motherland. Um, and it is, this is where uh, I try to, in, in, in the book that, that I've uh, published, which uh, in French looks, looks like this, um, thinking of ecology from the Caribbean world, I try to step aside from the scene of a lonely white man, middle class uh, worker, um, thinker walking around the virgin, the so-called virgin nature, and start thinking from the side, from the site of the hold of a slave ship. What does it mean to think of the world and the planet from the hold, from the violence, the 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 the, the, the horrible uh, legacies from the hold of slavery? And the final question, the third question that um, that that I engage with is, what comes after? What comes beyond uh, colonization? What, comes, what type of policies, what type of language, what types of alliances can we make to, to, go, to go beyond this fracture once this, uh, let's say, post-colonial, decolonial thought and environmentalism thought come together? What can we produce? How can we produce a narrative of the world, narrative of, dest of destruction 
that encompasses the different histories, especially of the histories of those that have been dominated, marginalized, the women, the poor, the workers, the enslaved, um, the witches. Um, how can we produce uh, not a slave ship, but a world ship to face the climate tempest? This is some of the questions I try to, to wrestle with. Hey, thank you, uh, Malcolm. Suddenly I was thinking like if a world ship um, might be a, a beautiful concept or image to think of a, another form of a, what museums have been to kind of return to what uh, Jumana began with, right? Uh, these these uh, infrastructural um, sites that have a, held the history of colonialism, right? And have allowed us to study it and yet are principal participants in the continuation of certain colonial um, relationships and also in hiding <laughs> the, 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 the colonial infrastructure as, as Malcolm said. Um, but before we move on to, uh, unless there's a, any question that any of you want to ask each other, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to the next question, but I wanted, yeah, yeah, you would prefer that? Okay. So I also wanted to hear, since we have a, an artist, an anthropologist, and um, environmental engineer and political scientist with us, I wanted to hear about how your different disciplinary formations um, mediate your understanding of this question of colonial destruction and the environment, right? So to hear you think kind of in some form of meta analysis about what that discipline, your discipline can bring to this question or what you feel it can bring and how it participates in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as an artist, usually my work is about kind of honing in from these meta structures and these mega networks of colonialism and capitalism, uh, like from their massive scale and complexity into much more intimate and small encounters um, of, of daily life, of materials, shapes, and textures that are around us. Um, and I want to believe that my work appeals as much to kind of a visceral and sensual register as to kind of these analytical modes in which we're speaking to today. Um, and so I thought to answer your question, it would be best to simply show some work and maybe through the works um, answer, answer to this. So if I go back to my share mode, um, I wanted to show some works that I think uh, relate to Sophia's research because when I was preparing for this panel, um, I read what I could find of her work and I felt like it resonated somehow with my thinking around sculpture. Um, and usually my sculptures are fragmented body parts or fragments of architecture um, that are placed on kind of um, uh, untraditional plinths, so kind of makeshift structures. Um, and I'm often thinking about the relationship between bodies and infrastructure. Um, and there's often a kind of an amalgamation of various worlds of kind of body building of construction sites, archaeology, waste building. Um, <clears throat> and in a sense, kind of, um, look, I, I, I start from perhaps an aesthetic point of view and that I, and from looking at waste and that I'm, I'm often intrigued at how negligence of infrastructure uh, creates gaps um, in society, kind of infrastructural gaps by the, the infrastructural gaps that are created that are then replaced by all kinds of DIY solutions, kind of individual um, in, um, expressions, let's call them. And um, I often I'm just walking on the side of the street and I see what I consider accidental sculptures. So um, just ways of fixing a certain pipe or the way that plastic is wrapped to kind of stop a leak or so on. So um, a lot of my inspiration actually comes from these, from this kind of patchwork culture um, that is a reflection of what I think Sophia was re referring to, a kind of failure to build um, that is intentional, that's part of a structure that, um, that wants to slow down a society and keep it, um, keep it behind. Um, but 
a lot of a lot of the materials I use are also uh, reusing waste. So like in the scaffolding, um, it's plastic sheets that I picked up um, and and used to wrap the the metal. So I also kind of I craft work and I also reuse materials that I find around me. Um, and here are a couple other examples of that. Um, it's, that's actually a trash can that the, the sculptor is oh. sitting on. So quite literally. Uh, and these are inspired by traditional drainage pipes, um, but taking on the form of limbs and a fragmented body. Um, but maybe to go back to the themes that I was talking about earlier on preservation, um, I thought to talk about a series of works called Caché. Um, and Caché is um, a series of sculptures that are inspired by khabias. Uh, khabias are traditional seed storage chambers that were built into the interiors of homes in the Levant to preserve grains for sowing, um, for sowing and for also the annual consumption. So I just go back to this image. This is a very large example of a khabia that would have served a very large family or maybe an entire village. Um, and I was really drawn to the beauty of these, um, of these architectural forms that are ap completely obsolete today. I mean, I, um, I came to learn about them through working with Rewak, which is a center for architectural heritage in Palestine. Um, and I was attracted to them as, as sculptural forms, how they relate to the architecture in which they're built and also how they relate to, to bodies, uh, to bodies as containers of sorts. Um, but also as a method of survival, a very intelligent way of um, storing something and preserving it throughout the year, um, but preserving it for survival. Um, and so it started by sketching a lot of these khabias that I would come across either in site visits, but also online and through the walks archive. Um, and I created a kind of interpretations of the khabias. So they, they just start serve as a starting point, but then kind of the sculptures take on a life of their own. Um, and they're made from clay. The main structure is made from clay and the, the, they're burnt. And then the surface is covered with tadlakt, which is a, actually a Moroccan tradition for sealing surfaces. Um, that's a mixture of clay and pigments. Um, and in the front room of the exhibition space, the khabias are kind of positioned as museological fragments um, that, that are again kind of uprooted from their architectural setting. And uh, in the second part of the room, they're, they're, they're placed on gridded shelves. <coughs> um, let me just get, yeah. And uh, I like the kind of tension between the, 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 the warmth of the clay and the tadlakt with the kind of coldness of the steel. Um, and the, this kind of shelving, this kind of metal steel shelving is quite common to see in seed banks, for instance, but also in uh, museum storages. Um, so what I, was, what I was interested in is kind of juxtaposing traditional forms of storage that are, that, that are based on sustenance uh, and survival practices with uh, storage facilities and storage traditions that um, that relate more to centralized economies of, of capital growth. So thinking about how this idea of preservation kind of has transformed um, throughout the centuries from, from, an, from a need to stay alive to um, a way of, um, a way of uh, capital growth and, and accumulation for, for certain institutions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do I have a few more minutes? I can talk about the film which yeah. Oh, to an excerpt of, yeah. So um, I also work with film. They're kind of two par I've kind of parallel practices that are at time are shown together and at times um, independently. And um, I thought to just kind of give some background to Wild Relatives because I, I would show a clip from it later and it's, it relates back to what I was talking about earlier about seed banks. Um, so Wild Relatives, tells the story of an agricultural research center that needed to move from Aleppo um, due, due to the Syrian war in 2014. And they moved to the Bika Valley in Lebanon, which is very close in fact. Um, but they were unable to move their seed bank, uh, which stored uh, one of the largest collections of seeds in the world. Um, and they decided to create a, a duplicate of the seed bank, which they couldn't move by withdrawing um, 
backup seeds that they had stored in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in, uh, in the Arctic Ocean. Um, so I kind of follow the journey of these seeds um, and all of the lives and hands that they move through in order to look at the matrix of labor and the economies behind the storage of these seeds. Um, so this is the kind of move of this agricultural center was, was heavily covered in the media because it was a way of talking about the war in Syria, um, but also food sovereignty and a lot of topics that are very, um, very much in vogue these days, let's say, to put it cynically. Um, and I, I was troubled by the way that the story was constantly portrayed, that it was always portraying the institutions as being the saviors of the seeds um, and, uh, and never telling the kind of backstory of the farmers who it's thanks to them that these seeds existed in the first place and who I think are the actual heroes to be celebrated. So for me, making the film was a way of telling a different story than the story that was being told in the media and certainly with a different language um, of image production as well. Because I think the, the way in which we tell the stories that we tell um, is just as important as the stories being told. Mm -hmm. um, so there's many, many layers to this film, but I mean, it's, and maybe when I show a clip uh, a bit later, it becomes clear that I, I try to address these um, sometimes macro histories, sometimes just micro histories that are reflecting on these kind of wider topics that we've talked about, but through individual lives and through quite intimate encounters with, with different characters. Thank you, Jumana. Um, Sophia. I'm sharing again. All right, let's see. Oops, one second. All right. So as an anthropologist, um, I work in a constant tension between two approaches to both colonial destruction and the environment. Uh, let me outline the tension first, and then I think I can talk a little bit more about how it plays out differently uh, in thinking about these two topics. The simplest way to describe this tension is as part of the age-old battle between constructivism and positivism, or in its more recent uh, or recently popular incarnation between epistemology and ontology. The former represented by terms like constructivism and epistemology suggests that experience and relations are inescapably framed by perceptual categories that change over time and from place to place. I like to use Mary Douglas's work on dirt to illustrate this point uh, because she argues famously that dirt is quote matter out of place and that its definition is therefore contingent on cultural categories of order and disorder. The latter, represented by terms like positivism or ontology, views truth as something that inheres in some phenomena. That truth can be perceived through certain forms of attention, but it stands on its own whether or not it is correctly perceived. One example that illustrates this approach is Bruno Latour's argument that when a person stands on a mountaintop to view the valley below, the physical height of the mountaintop, the firmness of the ground, and the light projected from the sun all for Latour physical or ontological truths affect the person's ability to perceive the view. Anthropology, as I understand it, has not reconciled this tension. At the same time, I do think it has sided more firmly with one approach for colonialism and has perhaps allowed the tension to breathe around the environment a little bit more. Since developing a greater consciousness of the historical imbrication of anthropology with colonialism, many anthropologists have understandably made it their mission to uncover the destructive qualities of colonialism's past and present. In doing so, we might say they've taken a positivist or ontological approach to colonialism, assuming that within colonialism inhere certain damaging truths and producing analyses that elaborate on the logics that allow the damage or its source to remain invisible, for example, to the colonizer, or on the embodied and cultural damage for the colonized. At the same time, questions around the relationship between humans and the environment have become more prominent, culminating today in the proliferation of references to global warming and what we're calling the Anthropocene. 
Much of this attention is framed by what we might think of as ontologism, that is by a concern that real environmental change is afoot as we see in extreme weather events, and by a concern that environmental harm is unevenly distributed in empirically identifiable ways. To put it simply, brown and black bodies are damaged and allowed to die more than white bodies are. Yet there are also anthropologists who are arguing uh, compellingly that it's problematic to uphold a nature society divide. Alongside environmental historians, these anthropologists have drawn on ideas like hybridity um, to depict phenomena that are at once social, ecological, and technological. Hybridity allows multiple causalities to account for change over time. Similarly, emergent multi-species ethnographic experiments demonstrate that socialities span diverse living species with the implication that ecologies do the same in a kind of Venn diagram. Scholars of colonialism have also long shown the many ways in which environmentalism in its most dominant incarnations, for example, as conservation or preservation, are often grounded in racialized narratives and processes of erasure. This has certainly been the case in Palestine. So we know that British colonial officials cast indigenous Palestinian lifeways as harmful to nature and wedged themselves between Palestinians and land in the name of conservation. Zionists have been planting trees on depopulated Palestinian villages, both to erase their signs and in the name of making the desert bloom. Such arguments force us to become more careful, I think, in attending to how and when environmentalist discourses are deployed, um, in appreciating the full range of political implications and possibilities also that emerge when the category environment is a prominent analytic. Thank you, Sophia. Um, Malcolm, would you would you like to share some thoughts about this question of disciplinary formation and how yours in particular or perhaps others um, helps shed light on this question of colonial destruction and environmentalism um, yes I, um, as I mentioned earlier I to have this double uh, education background. And, and, and the story here is that I had to move beyond um, some disciplinary boundaries. Um, so I was, I was trained as an environmental engineer in, in some sorts. And I realized that that really um, mediated the way I looked at some environmental issues in a very technical ma manner with a lot of numbers um, and with the belief that with the numbers, with the, with the right equation, with the right amount of material or money, that the, what we call ecological issues will be solved. And like that, and in doing so, we, I realized that doing this, what I was doing some humanitarian work actually in, in, in Darfur, I realized that I was going over what was in fact a political problem in a sense of a problem relating to the, to the police in Greece, in, in Greek, that is the, the way we, we live and inhabit the earth together or the way in, in, in relation to, to, to colonialism, we don't inhabit the earth together. Colonialism is really this way of inhabiting the earth without the other that do not look like me, or does not look like me, that does not present, or, or, or so on and so forth. And, it, and, and I realized that with the, the tools that I had gained, the, the analytical tools that I had gained with um, environmental uh, engineering, I had to, to, to step outside. And that's when uh, a training in, in political science and political philosophy was very important to me. Um, but that's, that's just one move. The other move I had to do growing up and, and, and um, studying uh, philosophy and political science in France was moving away from the 
uh, occidentalocentrism of of French uh, school of thoughts, for whom, for which uh, colonialism was just an historical subject, and slavery was just an historical subject, and had no impact on on the way we think of a problem, or, or no impact on the structure of knowledge production, or, or on the structure of of the way we will problematize, uh, for example, ecological issues. And this, for in, in my work, for example, I, I work on, on pesticide as a subject of research. I worked on pesticide issue um, in Martinique and Guadeloupe, uh, a pesticide that, that, that are used in banana plantation. Uh, the same we will use in, in, um, in Central America or sometimes in India or, or in the Philippines. And a lot of the time, people want to solve this issue by having a very tech limiting the pollution. Oh, it's a matter of changing the molecule. Oh, it's a matter of, um, I don't know, inventing some sort of uh, GMO bananas that will be uh, resistant to all sorts of pests and so on and so forth. But then it's just pushing away the problem. Uh, and that's, that's the, the, the question that I wanna, that political philosophy allowed me to ask this very same problem is, is first of all, how do we inhabit the earth together? General question. But more specifically, how do we inhabit the earth in the wake of the plantation that, would, that was a cornerstone of the colonial, um, the colonial projects? The, the, the way that the colonial habitation was to uh, transform a diverse and, and, and um, with diff a diverse earth, with different ecosystems, different forests, different monuments, and transform and mold all of that into different sets of puzzles, um, plantations of tobacco, sugarcane, uh, uh, cotton, and, and, and all sorts of stuff. So, so how do we inherit, inherit that? And, and how does that factor do we conceive when we think of a problem? So to answer the question in short, I, I try to move beyond the little uh, sometimes narrow-minded angles that some of my disciplines uh, provided me. And still to this day, it is still not so easy, in de depending on the context. I know, for example, in the US, it's very, um, I, I, I wouldn't say straightforward, it's very, clear that there is uh, the, the, the issue of racism is is raised that 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 you have a black studies department gender studies department you have post colonial studies departments or thoughts or technical thoughts in france which is different kind of colonial settings uh studying the colonial thoughts is even as a scholar is seen as being uh, a secessionist as being anti anti-french so every Every few or four months, you have scholars that are publishing op-eds in major newspaper saying, oh, we should ban these scholars, uh, even one that called for scholars like myself to be uh, put in prison and to be uh, uh, ch charged different fees. And, and these are the, the different, the, the social political context in which we are trying to solve or to think of a, of a problem. Uh, I hope that gives some perspective into the way I, I move between disciplines. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, before, before we move on, I just wanted to um, uh, ask the attendees if you are able to pose your questions. I know there's been hands raised and questions that are being posted in the chat, just so that it's actually it's more just for me so that it's easier for me to have them all in one same place if you can put your questions in the q a um which should appear somewhere in your zoom screen um it's a little button it, that would be very helpful because otherwise i have to both pay attention and be like streaming through the through the through the chat um to find your questions and i don't want to miss them um so that was just a shout out to everyone out there uh, because I know that's happening. Um, I was wondering if we could also um, hear your thoughts about, you know, the ways in which what you each do. And um, some of you 
what you each do disciplinarily, let's say, as an artist, as an anthropologist, as a political scientist with a foot in engineering as well. Um, some of you engage in environmental activism more directly, some of you don't. But in a way, the, the ways in which your, your commitment to kind of anti-colonial um, ways of reading the world is already a form of a, a activism. I mean, and in a way, Malcolm has just uh, made that very I don't know what happened. Hello? Hello? Oh, yeah? Am I back? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, the way in which Malcolm was describing, you know, being a decolonial theorist in France is already in itself being an activist. So, so I wondered if you could share some thoughts about the ways in which your work and also, directly speaking, environmental activism was this... Um, characteristic, you know, that it continues to have in many circles, right, around um, questions of like green ecology and so forth, right? A, how we can, you know, think about, you know, other horizons for the world, right? So is activism, the way is, is, is an engagement with these histories um, and telling stories otherwise, as you said also, Jumana, right? Um, what, what, what can this offer? What does this offer, right? Um, I know you wanted to show uh, a, a clip, right, Jumana? Yeah, but I don't know if that answers to your question now anymore. Um... I mean, oh. I, I, I guess I, I, you know, I would be reluctant to call my art activism in any direct way. Yeah. I mean, I think um, making art is obviously the way that I navigate the world and it's the way I learn about things and it's the way that I come mm -hmm. to formulate understandings um, through form, I mean, through actually forming the works, um, but also in encounters with other people and yeah, in the different forms of research, be them literary or field research, or again, lear learning mm -hmm. from other people. And I think um, when I did Wild Relatives, it was, um, it was also a way for me to learn about a field that I knew little about, which is kind of the history of biotechnology and, um, to understand more in depth what it, what, how this kind of the industrial agriculture that seems like there's no alternative for it for the scale of the kind of population of the earth today. How did that come about? Like, how did that truth become that kind of this kind of mainstream idea? Um, so I think art making is more a way for me to, again, to learn and to grow and to, um, to gain a deeper understanding of things. Um, I am interested in, let's say, um, direct actions or in kind of engagements, if that's within my own field, but also outside of it. But I wouldn't attribute that directly to my artwork. So I would say the artwork informs me. And then maybe as a citizen or as a practitioner, I can act um, from that knowledge which I've gained through working. But that could also be through writing or through, I don't know, social work could be through any, any other field that just happens to be that I'm, that I'm an artist and that's, that's what I do as a job. Um, so, so yeah, um, that's just, just as a comment that I don't, I don't see my art practice as, as an activist practice, um, but you know, at least with the films and maybe even with some of the topics that I deal with in, in the sculpture, there is um, at times a kind of a documentation um, of certain things where, where art can serve as a witness um, mm -hmm. or it can serve as a form of protecting a kind of cultural memory or, bring, or let's say giving it more importance. Um, um, but again, I think that's quite different from activism. Um, mm -hmm. And 
what I, the clip that I wanted to show, which I, I still could do, is, is, about, is uh, from this farmer who is in the film and Wild Relatives, who, doesn't, who was unrelated to the seed transactions that I just talked about between Aleppo, Svalbard, and the Arctic Ocean, and, and the Bukha Valley. So he's outside of this kind of institutional framework, but works in the Bukha Valley very close to that institution. And in the film, I, I, it was important for me to have him in the film as a kind of um, as an alternative way of seed protection. So in, the film primarily follows these major seed banks, kind of the, the Aleppo Seed Bank that is now in Lebanon and the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Um, but he works on a much smaller scale of, and, and, and through what he calls us, him and, and his, the group of friends who they work with, uh, what they call a seed library. So it's mm -hmm. not a bank that's kind of um, closed and quite difficult to gain access for, but it's a library which is based on exchange exchanging seeds and exchanging knowledge and um, and very much aware of how pesticides and chemicals and hybrid seeds have destroyed the earth, have destroyed both kind of rural populations, mm -hmm. but also the soil itself. Um, um, Jumana, so there is our, our very first attendee from India, who for them it's the middle of the night, um, yeah. saying, please show us the clip. Okay. <laughs> Since they were the first attendee, I would like to yeah. honor their request. Okay, I'll um, show a three minute clip. So okay. I'm just going to share screen and play the audio. I hope it's audible and smooth. All right. Um, more, more echoes to that request of you showing it. اسمي وليد محمد اليوسف من سوريا منطقة ريف حرب صار لي بلبنان من سبع سنين من وقت الحرب بتذكر عندي صور من بي هيك بمخيلتي كنا في الصباح كان بيوعينا مشان نروح نعطي مي لجنينة وكان أحيانا نقطة الخضرة بنجتمع العيلة كلها وبعلمنا كيف بنوضب الخضرة حتى يعني نكون جيدين بالمجال هذا عندنا الهبس من الجنينة أكثر الجزور البلدية أبوي بدون مواد كيموية صحيح هذه الجزور كانت فكرة يعني جوات كثيرة منهم يعني شبه راح ننضرب الأصناف البلدية يعني عم نجمع وين في ناس عم يشتغلوا بلدي مؤصل عم نحاول نتواصل معهم ونعمل نعمل على غاصة ضغط كثيرة ونتبادل الجزور كمان نتبادل الخبرات والأفكار حب وصل هنا لكل مزارع يعني صارنا في زراعة أنا بعتبر في استمرارية الحياة في أمل في تفاؤل أن في ناس في إنتاج يعني سليم للأرض لأن I 
هي ما من الريس الريس يطلع يعني طبيعي موسمه من شهر ثلاثة إلى شهر خمسة هذا الريس هذا بستفيد منه أكثر من شكل الشتلات كثير مبسوطين وكثير يعني إذا جاهم أمراض أمراض ما يعني بيأثروا عليهم مثل المناعة بصير عندهم الأرض فيها لها حياة يعني لها حياة دورة حياة جوا الأرض هي عالم ال يعني الدودة يعني شغلة كبيرة طالما الدودة في في مو هي مبسوطة ما عم تشتغل مضبوط طالما في مواد عضوية في ورا في جرازول في كومبوست في زبل بار هي تكون كثير مبسوطة ليه؟ لأنه بتنبسط على المواد العضوية وبتعمل خلايا جوا بقلب الأرض بترخى التربة Just another 30 seconds. I hope this refreshes. Dude, they are very important. Yeah. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. What are you doing? I'm also doing. I'm also doing. I'm also doing. What? The most popular in the world. Hey, the most popular. قد ما بيتمم بمصاري Alright That's what he That, that was beautiful, right? And the, at least in the subtitles I don't um, speak Arabic but the idea of a house right? He says a house for seeds a house as opposed to a bank Right, and it made me think that there is something that, in a way, everyone, all of you, are pursuing and um, trying to to imagine, right? Like the temporality of a house, as opposed to the temporality of a bank for life, for the ecology, um, for living uh, in this world. Uh, so, so, thank you for sharing that uh, clip, Jumana. Um, Sophia, did you want to share thoughts about this question of uh, environmental activism, the future, and livable forms of life? Um, yeah, I think I will, and I'll share my screen to do it again. Oh, wonderful. All this sharing. Okay. So it was interesting to me that your question was framed not in terms of environmental justice, but in terms of livable forms of life. Um, and in preparation, I, I went to find a definition of environmental justice so I could understand how they might be different. So in 2007, the EPA defined environmental justice as, quote, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. According to that definition, I do not see many possibilities for environmental justice under colonial rule. Colonialism preempts both fair treatment and meaningful involvement in environmental policy for the colonized. And it usually also prevents non-policy level environmental practices or makes them very difficult by obstructing access to the environment itself. But livable forms of life are another matter. These can ostensibly be squeezed into the interstices of domination punctuating with laughter, pleasure, hope, and meaning-making the slow environmental violence of colonial destruction. One argument in my book is that what I call Palestine's waste siege is a set of conditions that are inescapable, which is why I call them a siege, but they're also pliable. People create possibilities out of their destroyed ecological conditions. So I'll just give two brief examples. Across the West Bank, Palestinians have created markets for buying and selling used Israeli goods, including beds, clothes, home decor, and medical equipment. I argue that this practice can be understood as a response to inundation by cheaply made consumer goods 
with which PA economic policy has inundated Palestinians. In this sense, the used goods markets are critiques of the PA. In offering people embodied simulations of what it feels like to be a citizen rather than a subject of the colonial state, because the goods are perceived to be of higher quality, the markets approximate care by that state. The markets also build cultural capital for working class refugee men, the merchants who have lost land and livelihoods to settler colonial destruction, and who as storytellers animate and generate Israeli auras for the unlabeled items. Buyers and sellers in these markets do not see themselves as environmental activists. But in revaluing objects that would have gone to Israeli dumps and in refraining from consuming new goods that would have ended up in the PA's underground landfills, they are furthermore stemming the flow of environmental destruction in which they live. Another example asks how repair for environmental damage and prevention of greater damage can be achieved without control over territory. One answer to which many Palestinians have turned is verticality. Solar panels are now being placed on the rooftops of public schools in the West Bank and Gaza. Solar's proponents hope that it will decrease Palestinians' dependence on Israel for energy from 95% to 65% over the next three years. It can also decrease Palestinians' albeit modest carbon footprint. This example seems to tick some boxes for livable forms of life. Solar power is a tool for achieving sovereignty, and it works toward a long-term future that's less polluting and more energy efficient. Yet, I'm not sure whether we can count these examples as decolonial. For example, the practice of exchanging and adorning one's body with Israeli discards can also be experienced as colonial dumping, a particularly humiliating and intimate example of destruction. Rooftop solar panels, for their part, are funded through the Palestine Investment Fund, which people like Karim Rabia and Taufik Haddad have shown is invested in debt as the foundation for a large finance sector in Palestine. The fund is also partnering with centralized Palestinian electricity companies to pursue the solar project. These companies are responsible for forcing prepaid electricity meters into Palestinians' homes, transforming power from an unconditional municipal service into a commodity that only some can afford. Furthermore, arguments in favor of solar panels present them as good not only for independence from Israel, but also for the quote, for quote, growing the economy. Endless growth as a value is implicit within this vision of a more independent Palestine. This approach envisions greater consumption, less regulation of industry, including polluting industries, and so social inequalities and inequities we know from capitalist growth. Solar energy also becomes part of the PA's claim that it can develop its national assets and nat natural resources. Yet the Palestinian Authority itself was not established by democratic means, nor were its current leaders democratically elected. Perhaps it would be fruitful then, and I think this um, is one of the directions maybe you were headed, Natalia, um, to think together about the temporalities embedded in the term livable forms of life, for whom and for when are livable forms of life thought, and with what material consequences for the present. Thank you. Let me unshare. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, hey, for those examples. Um, I have a lot to say, but we, we, I'm, I'm going to let Malcolm uh, uh, tackle this, this question first. Um, first of all, I, I was very impressed by both the, the, the work that uh, Sofia and, and, and Jemana show. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing these beautiful uh, pieces of work and, 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 and images. Um, I would say that the way my work engages with environmental act activism is, is less about transforming the world, 
but really making worlds or world making in a sense that when you say transforming the world, you think that the world is already there, but really trying to build bridges, trying to go beyond this double fracture that I highlighted earlier, where you have on one side people working on um, environmental issue, on the other side people working on decolonial, postcolonial, or anti-racist or, or, or Afro-feminism issues. And um, so beside my, let's say, daily um, academic work, uh, I've been uh, meeting a lot of environmental activists, actually, who have been, especially even major NGOs like uh, Greenpeace France, because maybe, again, maybe in the US, uh, a strong and, and proud legacy of uh, black environmentalists or black environmentalism or indigenous and environmentalism. It is really not the case in France, really not the case in France. Uh, indigenous, French indigenous people like the, the Kanak in New Caledonia or the Kalina in Guyana, uh, French Guyana, they, um, they, they are not really counted as part of the French uh, environmental thoughts. So their experiences of, of even the French citizenship or of life or earth are really seen through the lens of exotism. So um, yeah, look at how they live together with, the, with the, the planet. But when it's time to really build our genealogy of how do we engage, how do we think of the way, for example, France or we, 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 we will come together, they are really not there. And so a lot of environmental NGOs like Greenpeace France realize that they can no longer, especially after the, the last few months of the Black Lives Matter movement that has spread worldwide, that they can really no longer um, continue with, this, with the whiteness of the ecological movement. And they, they've been engaging in, in a kind of a, a work to really think critically about their own construction. And for some of them, I've been helping them with that, or even just having a few discussion, uh, conversation, going to spaces that usually people like me do not go and speak. Uh, there was this one example, I was uh, earlier this year in Lyon, uh, a town of France where I was giving a, a conference. And when I knock at the door to, to get into the, the conference hall, one of the hosts asked me if I was the dancer uh, coming to uh, to dance, <laughs> I said no, no, I'm the one coming to give the conference. But the, this is some, and, and I'm trying to break some of that uh, ideas. But on the other hand, I think it is uh, it is maybe um, uh, it, it is an, an illusion to believe that structures, NGOs, governmental institutions that have historically um, excluded part of the population from the scenes from which we think the world and, and the earth, that they will suddenly say, hey, um, here's a space for you, come and think with us. So have the, I think decolonizing ecological scenes and, is important, but I think there's also a need to help foster, help grow over point of reference but also can claim to have an ecological discourse. Because one of the danger, and I've seen that, is that uh, some ecological or environmental NGOs say, oh, okay, we have forgotten about the impoverished suburbs. Yes, let's go and see them and tell them how they should recycle their water and recycle the, the waste and so on and so forth. And so sometimes they, there is a way in, in which they, they could recuperate the, uh, the necessity to decolonize while still maintaining the strong belief that they hold the key to the, the, the ecological discourse instead of really having a wide array of people groups that, that are you know that also present their own thinking and their own actions that we should all all, all celebrate so that's 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 the first the one of the one of the way in which i try to modify or, 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 or steer or sometimes influence uh, environmental activism from the point I am in. And I'm also uh, 
creating an NGO where we will really look at ecological issues and foster research on ecological issues from the non-sovereign territories of, of, of France as a starting point, not as an end, but as the way in which we conceptualize our relationship to the earth and the world, uh, trying to work on both sides. I mean, it seems that something that was shared in all of your answers and throughout uh, the conversation uh, and presentations you've been giving is that they're the way forward to build uh, a world ship, to use your, your, your figure, uh, Malcolm, is um, to go at the micro, right? to do a kind of micro politics or a micro action or even a micro uh, art. And by that, it's not only a question of scale, but a question of positionality vis-a-vis -vis institutions, hegemony, um, a states, right? Um, so that, that shift from environmental justice to think about questions of livable forms of life or to think of, as you said, Malcolm, right? Um, going, you know, building an NGO that is going to work with the ways in which as, as Jumana's film uh, showed, but also as, as a, a, her own description of the patchwork, right? Like, like people have been, or, or even Sophia's a description of this kind of reusing and selling of these Israeli goods by Palestinians, right? As opposed to like just generating more dump and then by buying more, shit um right it's like this question of the recycling like like at the micro level a eh, there are enormous practices a eh, of daily life a eh, of survival right and of and, and, and of action basically right so i, th I think of that, that that have been happening that a eh, a eh, even by those whom as you said malcolm are the ones who should never have survived, right? And there is we're not meant there. to survive. Or we're not, we're not meant to survive, right? Um, and, and, and that knowledge is, is home to, to libraries that we need to tap into, quite literally, right? And so that brings me to one of the questions that, that the, the, um, an audience member posed that, a, do you distinguish between action and activism, right? Because activism, uh, Sylvia Tiwon says, seems, is a term that seems to be perhaps more academic, right? Uh, and at least one degree removed from what people on the ground, right, uh, do. And that perhaps um, one could, uh, could art, and I would also add many other practices, uh, actually be action. Right, so it's is art or, or or a, the building of a livable forms of life a action. Do any of you want to say anything? Yeah, Sophia. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really um, helpful uh, binary to think with, or not binary actually, just a a twin twinning. Um, partly because what I found was that uh, my interlocutors who were dealing with this waste siege predominantly did not uh, uh, think of their own practices as political. Uh, other uh, practices were definitely seen as political, like going to a demonstration to oppose uh, a closure of a checkpoint or something like that. But uh, dealing with wastes inundation was matter of fact. And um, action is a really interesting word to use to think about uh, these practices because they were not inert, they were world making, if I wanna to go to Malcolm's term, which I think is very helpful also. Uh, they made a new state of affairs within five minutes of having begun. You know, each time they made a small, they chipped away in some small way at the world uh, they had begun with. Uh, and that new world wasn't always definitely improved, but it was action. Uh, there was a, there's a way in which um, Palestinians I've often felt are kind of also frozen in time in their current occupied status, right? There's a frozen image of the Palestinian peasant as a kind of ideal form, but also today we have certain images of Palestinians sort of stuck 
um, because there is stuckness that is movement specific or you know related to other huge obstacles that the that the Israeli occupation presents. But there's action every day, uh, and so I just I really appreciate the the value of that. Do Malcolm or Jumana wanna uh, address? that question of action or as action or art action versus instead of activism? You're, you, you, Jumana, you are, you are muted. Sorry. Yeah, I was saying that I, um, I think it's a helpful question to think through and I, I don't know, I feel like it could go in so many different directions depending on um, in which in which area or which sense the word action is used um, because action in, in, in art is often used also as a gestural, it can also be kind of, yeah, gestural, performative and so on. Um, but I think, I mean, when I think of activism, it's about uh, visibility and making something visible um, to a broad uh, audience um, and intervening in certain structures in order to change them. Um, action is also employed within activism. You do actions, act, activist actions, um, but action on a daily life is maybe not always um, acting or act, is not necessarily uh, in order to be visible. It's not in order to um, um, yeah, not in order to do it for an audience necessarily. Um, but again, I'm confused as I'm answering because it depends in which, in which sense we're using the term the term of action because action can also absolutely be about uh, making something visible but that was my immediate uh, thought that mm -hmm. um, yeah and also I mean at the same time you you are making you make things right and that that in its making is an action and you may all the at least all this work that you showed I would just push to say makes visible and by telling other stories about those forms of a colonial preservation, division, and mm -hmm. freezing. Right? Yeah, but I think and it's interesting because be a, yeah, uh, yeah. I was just thinking that action can also be a, um, um, yeah, can be done in a kind of more private. Um, yeah, I don't know actually. I'm not sure if I can come to any <laughs> helpful answer. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it would really depend on a kind of a more a specific placement of these terms. Yeah, yeah. I just thought also just to add like the idea that you are, you know, there's all this move of like freezing, right? A, both symbolically, a, politically, but also literally of seeds. And in a way you, you, you're making of at least the projects you showed as a way of unfreezing and resituating them, right? Um, and freezing as what what's, wants to stop action versus the movement, what seems a movement and exchange um, is a necessary part of this house or library of knowledges and um, even of other forms of preservation. Um, Malcolm, you wanted to speak and then there's many yeah. other questions. <laughs> yes. Um... I will, I will use uh, one or two thinkers in a way that probably they were not meant to be interpreted. Um, one being Arnenes, so the founder of a movement that I'm very critical of, the deep ecology. But he has this line, but it's still very interesting. I think it's very important to sometimes bring thinkers into spaces they didn't consider. But he used saying, this fact saying everything is political even though not everything has the same political relevance. Mm. Uh, and in, in a way that, that is like, if even actions that look small in scope are participating in the world in some sense. But the second thing uh, which I think is more relevant to this discussion between action and act activism is, is Anna Arendt. In, 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 the, in the sense that for her action, the, the, the way she's an action, action is very related to one which it creates, it, it's, 
it's the act by which it's uh, a world is possible, uh, an, an act by which uh, you can create a world, which in, in, which in my interpretation of the word world in, comprises of both bringing people together, but also um, bringing people, ecosystem, non-humans together. So, uh, so personally, I would understand action as, as the realization of this world making, in a sense, and an act which bring about the world. And activism, I would understand it as being all the diff different, different little everyday, even uh, tasks that you have to do to make an action possible. So as a scholar, for example, because of the consideration I have for the painstaking work that activists do just to organize a demonstration, just to run an NGO, just to make sure that there is a table and there is food for people to meet and to talk about what's going to happen. Um, and, and all of these things are part of what constitute activism. It's not just, hey, I made a speech or hey, I, I worked. It's, it's all of that, all that work that is hidden. I, do not claim to be an activist uh, per se. But then, th that thing, that's where also art, and especially uh, you know, writing and, and sculpture making come into play, is the fact that sometimes what, what is left of all these actions? And what is very interesting about art, especially, is that even though it is created uh, sometimes in spaces you don't see from the outside, the, the, the pieces of art in itself contain a, a world or represents worlds, uh, have traces of worlds. Uh, so some sculptures of, from what Jumela showed, I think does that really well and showed world in their fractures, not necessarily all, no, in, in, in their different composition. And, that, and, and so that's why sometimes there is this, this dialogue between action and, and art as well. Um, yeah. Mm yeah thank you um i wanted we we have very few minutes left but perhaps we can go over a couple minutes and get through a couple questions um there's a great uh question by Seus leonardo who's a colleague here uh, at berkeley um and he says uh, he wants to ask about uh, stuckness and he says he wonders if stuckness is a settler colonial trope of lack of movement in contrast to nomadic of settling, which be, uh, believes uh, what we understand, well, no, belies, sorry, what we understand about history and people making it, right? So the difference between, the contrast between uh, stuckness and settling. And I know that even though one says settler colonialism, and of course, given the composition of this panel, one assumes the question is for uh, Juman and Sophia about Palestine, I would urge um, Malcolm to also think about that question because um, uh, a, of the, the, the specific political uh, characteristic of a place like Martinique or Guadalupe uh, in relationship to a colonial, continued colonial history. So I, I don't know if you had any thoughts on this question of stuckness and settling Um, I think, um, I think it's a really interesting comment because settler colonialism tends to favor in placeness. Um, so this is sort of like the, the faulty version of in placeness that, um, I guess what, what I think I feel the way Jumana felt about the last point about action and activism, that maybe um, it depends on who's using the term. I mean, I, I've kind of used the term on my own. It's not a term uh, that, that I've heard used um, in activist circles so much, for example. I mean, there's a lot of um, commentary, of course, on Palestinians' lack of freedom of movement. Um, in the West Bank and Gaza, but um, the stuckness was like a, an affective state that I felt I witnessed when I was there. Um, so it's something imposed, and I guess once it's imposed, it probably appears to be 
appears a certain way to the colonizer, but it does stand in contrast to the way I felt a lot of Israelis or at least sort of representatives of the Israeli state viewed the Palestinians, which was definitely not as stuck in place. In fact, it views them as constantly moving in a way that is dangerous to the state. So uh, that legitimizes, that perception legitimizes, in fact, the constant uh, practices of control of Palestinians' movement. So um, I guess, yeah, I'm not sure where that goes for us, but um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put it in conversation for a second with Waste to say that what I saw um, happening was that Palestinian waste was viewed as even more uncontrollable than Palestinian bodies, which um, the infrastructures of the occupation have become quite adept at controlling. But waste and smoke from burning trash or sewage um, still present huge challenges to um, the state apparatus in Israel. And I think that's interesting. It's sort of the refusal of waste to be stuck uh, that seem to be very um, powerful for the dynamics currently at play in mm -hmm. Palestine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jumana or Malcolm, did you want to tackle this question, or should I ask one last question from the from the group? You, Jumana, saying ask another. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to ask. Um, a, give you all two questions that are there and if you any of you feel like tackling either one they're uh, somewhat related uh, one is um what neo-colonial purpose can the act of preservation serve today in other words why does contemporary hegemony allow for or even encourage and sometimes even fund acts of preservation museums research etc right so this uh, attendee, Georgi Sintsadze, I'm sure I pronounced that very wrongly, um, uh, wants to push back on this category of preservation, right? And it's a, a also inherent link to the practice of hegemony. Um, and then there is, wait, did they take this down? Oh, someone took it down. Okay. There was a question uh, there before uh, for Malcolm, and somehow I don't, I don't, I can't really see it. Um, uh, yeah, I can't see that question anymore. Um, but it had to do with the need to also uh, shift and decolonize epistemologies to even tackle these questions of livable forms of life. Oh, you, you, you answered Malcolm. Oh, okay, okay, I was like, where go? I'm, I'm still new to this. So, well, so this question of, you know, the way in which preservation is used uh, in a way to continue um, forms of racism, forms of um, ecological devastation, right? Um, uh, and so on through different types of institutions or ac action activities, right? Research, museums, etc. Yeah, Malcolm. Um, I think it's it it serves uh, at least um, three purposes, um, and and it, it is important because it's it's a, it's a it's a ongoing struggle. But this preservation allows um, to hold on to a certain story of the world, a ci um, the, the, civil the, the civilization mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's 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 the, the, the link that was drawn. I don't I don't remember if it was Sophia or Jumana between mm -hmm. the preservation in, in museum and the preservation of some spaces as if they were in museums, and it yeah. allows to. Uh, create this scene for the eyes of the of the Westerner, where he's without a body and he's looking at different paintings, at different cultures, at different, you know, uh, as if, but he's in the center of the world. And and what does that 
story has why why is it so hard to relinquish that story i was in brussels lately and i went to visit the museum of Tervuren, which is called the africa museum but it's actually a museum about the belgian congo but they call it the africa museum and when you go there you learn nothing about africa nothing and it's a museum that was closed for five years with the claim that they were trying to decolonize themselves and there it's a strong example of the refusal to let go of a certain story, of a certain gaze. But why do they, do they keep that gaze? Because it allows also to maintain a kind of, to use the concept of Gloria Becker, a white innocence. So the belief that we are, or the, the, the country of the world has been innocent with respect to certain, certain people. And in return, what that white innocence does is it maintains a culture of irresponsibility. That means there is no need to, to take into account or to, or to render justice or sometimes to pay reparations and, and, and to institute objects. So, so that story allows one to exist in a site of, in this place of comfort where um, the others do not, do not exist and do not need to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was very powerful. Did, did, I, it looked like you wanted to say something, Sophia. No. Jumana, do you feel you want to say something? Um, I mean, I'm just conscious that we're going over time and this is a, yes. like a, quite a big question, but I mean, I can just say to that, that I, I, I think we still very much live under colonial relations. So, I mean, all of these mechanisms of preservation, we can take any example and they're very often used to upholding power relations that are there. Um, so if that's again, seed banks that are there to preserve so-called you know, biodiversity, but who are those seed banks good for? They're not good for small farmers. They're usually good for big business. I mean, even if we look at preservation laws and nature reserves, again, they often go against um, local populations who live in that area. And those laws only apply uh, as long as it's convenient for, for the state until they need to extract something from it. So, um, so yeah, I think um, preservation from, from, from its early days, let's say from kind of early modernity and this kind of this obsession for, for origins and for, um, um, yeah, re restoration and uh, all of these 19th century ideas that kind of made preservation um, um, so prevalent in so many different fields continue to operate along very similar mechanisms today. They just take on new terminologies and, um, you know, they get masked under environmentalism and so forth. But uh, unfortunately, I don't feel like the relationships have changed that much. Yeah, yeah, uh, very true. Um... I, I think that um, unless Sophia wants to say something to this question, um, a, or if e any of you would like to add some last comments, I know it's a kind of abrupt ending, but I think it's, a, it's an ending filled with uh, a lot of very profound reflection that brings in the need for a embodied forms of knowledge and reflection at the micro level because the relationship between you know the ways in we in which uh, many forms of environmentalism continue to be linked and subservient to both epistemologies and institutions uh, that are racist and uh, operate under colonial forms um, is there and that perhaps we take with us from today that this embodied, we, we need to return to the body, right? You, 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 offer, you yourself, even though you said, you know, you're, you're not, uh, your practice is not analytic as an artist, Jumana, right? You're, mm -hmm. no, that it's visceral. That. I said it works alongside. It works I alongside, I, I don't want to create a dichotomy of analytic and visceral. Yeah. I think that dichotomy is false. So it's very much alongside. Yeah, I know, I, yeah, I do, I do too. So th thank you for correcting yeah. me. Um, that it is in that visceral and sensual relationship to the world that we, we will be able to, to perhaps a, a engage in, 
uh, or pay more attention to actions that, uh, through which we can build a, a world ship that can be a house for many forms of life. Um, so that, that is my, my, take, my personal takeaway. Um, and I think it's very uh, profound, at least for me in these times. And I wanted to thank all of you uh, for being here and particularly Malcolm and Jumana for whom it is very late on a Friday night where I am sure they have many better things to do. Um, I wanted to thank all the attendees, the participants, and all the questions that were not asked. We will be sending them to uh, Jumana, Sophia, and Malcolm uh, in, uh, probably later today so that they can um, have your questions. I'm sorry we were not able, I was not able to ask all of them. So thank you very much. It's a very, un, you know, such a strange way when one, one has to finish these Zoom events. But thank you for sharing your time, your practices, your thoughts uh, with us. And have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you for gathering us. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.